it would be great if plain writer Ren also wrote plays. I think that would be a cool development. No, in it, her it's play. just my it's just my southern accent not enunciating <laughs> enough. No, <laughs> plain but it's good. Writer, not plain writer. I, <laughs> I wanted to translate for anybody else that was listening. Welcome to Critical Cafe. Join us as we chat about the latest episode, the campaign as a whole, and critical role in general. All while we partake in a delicious cup of coffee. So grab yourself a tasty beverage, settle into your favorite cozy spot, and get ready for a little geek philosophy. Welcome back to the Critical Cafe, where we're going to talk about Critical Role Campaign 3, episodes 43 and 44 this time. Double shot of an episode, if you will. My name's Brian, and this is Crystal. Hi. And we're just going to jump right into it, so here we go. All right, so uh, episode 43 kind of starts out where we left off with 42 right in the thick of the quote-unquote action because we've got this (laughs) bird-like creature uh, coming down on the group. Um, So it it was sort of a a cliffhanger of an episode where they were uh, out into the city and then this bird sort of appeared um, and kind of caught us all off guard because nobody really knew what it was except for the fact that FCG recognizes it. So... Yes. Uh, yeah. What did you think about the start? I mean, I think it was ridiculous. I mean, it was funny. You know, it ended the last the episode before this ended with them seeing red eyes and hearing some like screechy noises. So we're thinking it's going to be some big bad, you know, <laughs> something coming out of the shadows. And it ends up being this weird, disgusting necro bird <laughs> who <laughs> likes to poop on FCG's head. So yeah, as you do. I mean, it was it was definitely funny. Apparently, this bird follow his follows him around, and poops on him to ruin his life. <laughs> and I think they even like kill it at some point, and then it just comes back to life. <laughs> and they do. Um, FCG does talk with it a little bit, uh, and it just tells him that I, I guess their lives are tied together. And as long as he's alive, the bird will be alive, and he'll keep ruining his. <laughs> Yeah. It was it was ridiculous. <laughs> I have a feeling there will be more to come on that bird. Like I'm sure it'll show up again, but really, sort of a funny way to start things off. Yeah. Um, but then yeah. you know, as that's beginning, they also realize uh, pretty quickly that they're missing somebody. Yeah, Ashton's not there. And they message him right, and yeah. uh, so he's like, oh, "I'll catch up with you guys later." Like, kind of leaves it um, pretty blank. Very vague. And then, yeah, pretty vague, and th- which is a good way to handle that when you don't know, or when you know somebody is going to be gone from your game. So, uh, so they go to the school and they talk to um, a lady there. I think her name is Carol, and um, they're trying to get information on the different professors, uh, specifically the ones who deal with Ruidus. And then you know, FCG also wants to talk to. Uh, one of the professors that knows anything about automatons. Um, but the more pressing matter is trying to find, um, it was Ebon L. Kai is the name of the professor mm-hmm. that deals with anything along the lines of or pertaining to Ruidus and the Ruidus born. So she's pretty resistant, yeah. a little rude. And then one of them, I think it's FCG, ends up casting what, Fast Friends on her. Yeah, and, that's right. <laughs> and it becomes so funny because all of a sudden she changes her tune. And then not only does she tell them exactly where the guy lives, but she takes her break from work and takes them to his house. Um, but as you know, before that happens and as they're uh, finishing up their conversation with her, you know, there's a commotion down the hallway and you see this huge being come in that just looks massive you know he's very intimidating um and we find out that there are adjudicators or adjudicators um there and they've been there for a couple of weeks so they kind of figure all of that out as they're exiting like the university or the school on their way to evan alkai's house yeah and, um, and they're from they're originally from vasselheim right like or yes or yeah. My, yeah so so it's sort of uh i can't remember who i think it was fern or somebody that actually picks up on who they are um but yeah so uh interesting that they're 
in the city and it's almost like they're being tolerated it seems like they're they're they have them there but it's not like they're you know they were welcomed there to begin with with open arms right, right? so well yeah, and pretty... it seems like they're searching for someone so yeah. you know they're not there for pleasantries right i mean they're there um to to search out and somebody who apparently did something pretty bad you know if and... it calls for these guys to come out so and the judicator order has been around like since the calamity right like that's when that started so yes. the, yeah yeah the you know having them around or the existence of this group uh whatever they're diving into has been around for a long long time so yeah really interesting oh, and and the other thing like the whole fast friends thing i thought was interesting because game mechanics wise like at the end you realize that someone cast the spell on you so they're having to like so they're, they're like oh well um, let's be interested in her and let's like, try to make her like, let's real really make her. her our friend <laughs> so, <laughs> so that yeah. maybe when the spell wears yeah. off, she won't be so angry. Yep. <laughs> I have a feeling that lady is going to be pissed. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting when they run into her Ooh. later, I think. So, especially yeah. she took her lunch break and everything, you know, and they were being nice and they were talking to her, but, um, you know, to then reinforce it by the time they get to the house, they start thinking, okay, well, we don't know if this lady's actually gonna be any better. So let's get right. some dirt on her. And so they end up using the spell to get her to confess to the fact that she's stolen things from her workplace. <laughs> so just in case, if, yeah. <laughs> just in case yeah. she tries to say anything. They can blackmail they have, her. Yeah. You know, they have blackmail on her. Or, you know, yeah. just to keep her mouth shut. Yeah. So, because if she comes to and she remembers everything that's happened, of course she's not going to want to, like, incriminate herself. But I think that they also got out of her kind of, like, what her hopes and her dreams are. And mm -hmm. um, they were talking about giving her some money and stuff, too. So I think that they're, they're you know, it's like threefold. <laughs> let's yeah. make her our friend. Let's bribe her and blackmail. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I mean, they did what they could in that circumstance, yeah. right? So, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's it's fun. So, so they actually get to the house that they were, or the person that they're looking for. Um, and then it's sort of like, let's break into the house, right? Like they start scoping oh it out. They start trying yeah. to do their whole like uh, B and E to figure out like how to get in. Yeah. Uh, which I mean, is interesting. Chetney, yeah. 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 Chetney goes invisible. And then the others pretend to be gardeners. <laughs> So they're all outside yeah. of the house, like pretending to be clipping, you know, the bushes and whatnot. And then um, Chetney goes in invisible and I, there's not really anybody in the upper part of the house, but he ends up mm. triggering a trap, I think, heading downstairs. He smells sweat, you know, he can, you know, he can sense out other things because of his werewolf, um, his keen smell, smell scent. But um, so I guess he figures out that there must be somebody downstairs or people downstairs. So yeah. the group comes in, you know, trigger a trap, but then they get down into the basement and there's two people down there um, trying to kind of hide behind boxes and, you know, like bins and things like that. And so there's a, a short little kind of, I think scuffle that happens uh, because they immediately, the, the two people immediately start trying to fight. Yeah. They're scared. And you could kind of tell just through what Chetney was saying that they've been down there for a while hiding. Um, and so instead of them having a conversation, they went straight into defense and the group wasn't really able to say, Hey, we're looking for so-and-so we've come with a recommendation from you know, whoever. So, um, I think, you know, they defensive tactics, whatever. And then it's just long enough for the one guy to cast a spell on the floor and they shift it out. So the group runs just right after them. <laughs> yeah. They're like, all right, we'll go. So <laughs> right. everybody, you know, never you mind that Ashton yeah. is still in the city somewhere. You know, yeah. let's just, let's go. So let's teleport somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. So it had, so that's kind of where they take the break in this episode, right as they go through. And I think uh, Matt picks up from them appearing uh, on the other side of this place, and which they find they didn't just teleport; they went to a different plane. So they plane um, shift, yeah. Yeah. So f the good thing is, uh, like, they're able to kind of, um, you know, have this experience of plane shifting to another place, and the players 
as he's describing things and and who's you know who's there the players start recognizing where they are but their characters have no idea right so yeah, it's that yeah. whole player knowledge uh player knowledge character knowledge yeah. thing that is you could tell you know, marisha marisha really was like oh my god oh, oh yeah yeah was, oh, oh. you know so it was kind of it was kind of funny because you could tell again like what you're saying like the players had some knowledge but yeah. and they were piecing together who who everyone was and um which made it really they, you know it made it exciting for the moment it's like oh what's happening okay all right there's somewhere that they you know the players are recognizing but the the actual yep. um you know the actual group it doesn't so and it, it's um, something that happens all the time in this hobby of ours where you play through a camp and, and i think we're only just seeing this more and more in critical role because of each uh campaign has been different yeah and there hasn't been as much crossover in previous campaigns as there has been in this one there's a lot more cam uh, crossover i think at least in this campaign with the other two um there was a little bit of crossover from campaign two to campaign one but um it shows what happens when people play at their home games a lot where you have right. people that go through something you meet npcs you do all this stuff with a character that you're playing at the time then you're playing another character and you run into those npcs again and it really pushes that whole like i've got to play this as just i just met this person and i don't know all the things that they've already done uh in the past that my other character knows about um and it's a challenge to do that right like naturally you remember how people treat you and things like that. And when you're playing a role-playing game, that NPC treated you a certain way when you were right. playing this other character. So it's hard to it's hard to split that. And I thought they did a good job of like of really um, playing their current character and not uh, leaning too much on their player knowledge. Which you know, I I just wanted to highlight that because I think it's a common thing in all of these games that we play where you can run into that. And sometimes it's not so easy to do that so yeah it's good yeah so they shift into the plane of fire into a cavern that you could tell is kind of worked as a home mm -hmm. base a little bit i think or a hideout and um once they get there there's a third person that's with the other two and so they get introduced to playwriter ren um, and that was who they kept, they were guessing, you know, ahead of time. Oh, I think this is where, you know, playwright Ren is at or whatever. So, um, they do get introduced Wait. to her. Sorry. Uh, are you saying playwright or plane writer? Oh, sorry. Plane writer. Yeah. Plane writer. <laughs> it would be great if plane writer Ren also <laughs> wrote plays. I think that would be a cool development. No, in it's, her it's just my it's just my southern accent not enunciating enough. <laughs> no, Plain but it's good. Writer, not play I, writer. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to translate for anybody else that was listening that may not pick up on any yeah, so, North Florida accent. It's plain writer, <laughs> red, not, not red play writer. Accent. Although I yes. think it would be plain great if she wrote writer. plays too. Maybe she will write a play yeah, about play this writer. whole experience. <laughs> yeah. So plain writer in. Let me an, an over enunciate plain writer. But yeah, so they meet her and they really, I mean, they delve in pretty quick talking about, you know, what's what with Rudis. And I think that um, the professor and plain writer Wren were really not anticipating that the group would have a clue what was really happening. And so they quickly found them fascinating because they had so many, like they had so much more information yeah. and it was like their group provided info and their group provided info. Yeah. And we got a lot more, you know, clues oh as to goodness. what's kind of going on. It was so we great. We found out so, so much, much stuff yeah. in this conversation. Yeah. I wonder, is it, is it, um, you know, rather than go through blow by blow the conversation, why don't we just talk about some of the stuff that we now know we've kind of suspected, yeah. but now we know based on what they're like. So for example, we know that Ruidus is a prison of sorts now or, or yes. a confinement. Um, we suspected it was holding something. Now we know that it is yeah. um, and not just a something, a creature, a being, um, you know, beyond mm -hmm. the gods, somebody that came over that the God, this is way pre calamity. This was at the right. formation of the world of Exandria that this all happened. 
Um, uh, so Predatos, right? So, um, yeah, Predatos. So this Predatos, the predator, basically, is what <laughs> I'm taking Not Ukatoa, but that. we can use the same Predatos. <laughs> yeah <laughs> we played uh we we're gonna play ukatoa we got yeah. that game so we'll, we'll let Christmas. you know how it goes yeah so we'll we'll give you some insight on uh yes. that when we play our first game but um so yeah so i think really interesting that they've kind of confirmed some things that we thought although some of this stuff not the name Prodathos or like a definitive um thing was ever said some of this stuff was kind of i don't want to say leaked but already in the lore from the Call of the Netherdeep game oh, adventure that was released, was there was a little bit of this that already existed out there from that. But I think it was done really well because people that had played that game may have already knew that. But they, again, player knowledge, character knowledge. Yeah. None of these characters I've never that. played these, it, so I, yeah. I didn't. And, and I purposefully did not look through the, the um, books that have come out. Yep. Um, for the gameplay with Matt's yep. world, just because I I don't want to over like I don't want to have the the extra knowledge in my mind. <laughs> yeah, I want the story to unfold as the story unfolds. I am not somebody who reads the back of the like the back pages of the book of a book and then yeah. goes to the front. No, I I like what I love about uh, piecing things together is the little nuggets you get along the way and then your brain working enough to kind of go, Oh, okay, this is right. what this is. And this yeah. is what it is like, that's a part, that's a part of what I love about being, um, you know, investigative and stuff. So I, yeah. I tend to try my best not to spoil anything. No I don't even go online and look at stuff. So, <laughs> and, and what's, but here's what I think. I agree with that. And I do the same thing. I only knew about it in passing after I had seen that part. I went back and, and uh, read yeah. some things uh, about for completely other reasons that I'll get to in a separate video. But I uh, was looking at some of the stuff that was created by Critical Role and came across some of the information. What I think is great about that, though, is if you did play that, you had a little bit of a, right. a chunk of knowledge while you're watching this. And you go, oh, I know. And if you didn't, nobody gave anything away. Like they had theories and it kind of worked out. It also, and third big point to this, is that he has really thought through his world. Oh right? my goodness. Like this stuff is played yeah. out and planned very, very well so that he can pull from all these little nuggets yeah. of knowledge and present them in a way that playing the game um, really feels like they're discovering all this stuff. Because you got to think that everybody at the table, or at least most of the people at the table, had read or been involved in at in some way with the, right. the call of the nether deep stuff that the stuff he's already made. Right. So right. Um, yeah. at least a couple of them must've known, uh, maybe not Sam or Ashley, but the rest of them <laughs> probably had some feel for like what was going on. But yeah, part so I me, thought it was really, really yeah. well, well done. Part of yeah. me really wonders about the dynamics behind the scenes, you know, like Matt has got this genius mind for, just being able to invent massively flourishing, you know, cities and people and, and things. But then, you know, who he married, Marisha, she like, she's kind of the not in your face, super smart, right? Like, oh, man. yeah, she is the, really she's the one that has she, all yeah. the notes. She like, so sometimes I'm like, okay, I know he doesn't do anything to spoil things for her, but I wonder if she helps him keep some of this stuff straight, you know, yeah. like they're like, how do yeah. you do it all by yourself? You know, I mean, yeah. I know you do a lot of stuff and I help kind of proofread or go through and watch a video or, you know, but I, I can't invent those things. I can give ideas and I can kind of maybe, you know, like spitball a little bit with you, but overall, like that's your brain. Well, <laughs> but, you know, I think even, even authors, like even like I, I you know, I, you and I read uh, the Dresden Files and Jim Butcher even says there's times where he'll go check the wiki because yeah. like keeping all of that stuff in your brain, sometimes you got to go back and you're like, it's all these fans have put together, you know, this wiki of all this information that's come out. So sometimes the fans end up knowing more at right. some level about like some of the details than even the person that wrote it would know just because it's hard to keep all that straight. And that person, and this is the case with game production too, you have all the drafts in your brain. Yeah. Like if you yeah. write something, you know yeah. all of the versions <laughs> that you were thinking about 
And then sometimes you have to remind yourself, oh, I didn't do this when I released it. Yeah, I did this there's instead. no way so I could keep any hard. of that yeah. straight. I have yeah. to have my, like, you know, even whenever I read extensions, like massive, like, you know, reading um, George R. R. Martin or mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings or whatever, I end up having, I need family charts. I need <laughs> yeah. maps. I need, you know, I need to, I want to know how it all fits, but I can't even imagine trying to make it all fit. Yeah. Um, and having all of the ideas in your brain. I mean, I already struggle enough with the, the, you know, the more artistic ADHD brain. Like I couldn't even imagine trying to make it really make sense on paper. So, so something, you know, something I just thought about as you were saying that, that I never, it never really occurred to me. Um, there is one benefit that Matt Mercer has, um, is that he's likely never going to have anyone else play through these campaigns, right? Like if you are writing a published adventure, so if I go out and I buy Call of the Nether Deep or Lost Minds of Fandelver or any other published adventure, and I have a bunch of people that are playing it, um, I might have one group and then maybe I have a year later another group that comes and plays it. Each of those games are going to be really different, even though right. it was the same storyline and the same NPCs and stuff, because the players were different. Matt Mercer never has to worry about another group of players going through <laughs> his campaign because it was specifically crafted for this group of people and these players. So the good thing is he doesn't have to worry about different versions of his game. Right. 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 Like, whereas if yeah. I was playing a module or an adventure that was written by him and I used it for multiple groups, not only do I need to know the stuff, but I have to remember how that stuff changed for every time I played that yeah. game or I ran the game yeah. for a group, which is another layer. So he does have that going for him that he doesn't have to, you know, right. remember all the different versions of the game. He's just got to stick with the one main story. Like that's kind of a digression, yeah. but yeah. I think it's for all the DMs out there or all the players too. That is something you got to consider that is you know that's uh, yeah dming is hard guys <laughs> like I, all, you, I, all you people out there that are dms my hat tips to you because uh it is a hard job that uh yes. that's why there's a lack of game masters and dungeon masters compared to players right there's a lot of people that want to play and not a whole lot of people that will run it so um, anyway, well, that's it, a it, it, so. you know, you're, you're so on the spot and, you know, just with yeah. me trying to do a few here at the house with you and Ethan or, you know, my, our 10 year old kid, um, I, I get, so I'm not good. I need to know the information I need, you know, so even if I read through it, looking at it from a DM's perspective versus a player's perspective, like I don't have all of the words to make it yeah. sound exciting. You know, I have a good vocabulary. I read, I read a ton. I have an extensive library, but it's, I have a better imagination than things that come out of my mouth. <laughs> so like I can, in my head, things are like, can be so grand and so wonderful. The minute my mouth yeah. opens, it's like, blah, 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 blah. you know, like, and sure. so then I, if I'm put on the spot, it's even worse. I'm so much better whenever I'm just going, you know, my brain stops whenever I feel like I'm put on the spot and I'm not prepared. So, yeah. uh, you know, DMing is very hard and I give all the kudos because I know that I, could I do it? Sure. Would I be good at it? Yeah. So I, I say years that DMing years really years well years with the practice. experience. <laughs> I think anybody that wants to do it could do it and you would have fun. And, as, and the thing is, as long as everybody at the table is having a good time, you're, you're doing great, yeah. right? Nobody has yeah. to be, I'm broadcasting over the internet to thousands of people good. Right, right. You just have yeah. to be good enough for the people at your table. So right. anybody that is thinking about it, don't let us, you know, psych you out of it. You could do it. Yeah. There, it's, it's, I not, would totally it's not so do hard kid that you could games. do yeah. You know, kid yeah. games, because I think that the level of expectation, they get, they get excited yeah. about everything. So, you know, I could totally do it's a, a great kid place game. To but start. an adult game, and I'm like, get you. Ah! It would also get you comfortable to yeah. 
be with adults playing because you'd get you'd get psyched up but anyway that's that's a whole other yeah, yeah, yeah. so all right uh, anyways so, we were way yeah, off yeah, well yeah. Yeah, that's that's so, good though that's part of the game yeah. right so so I they do. so they not only they find out that but they also find out more uh, so why don't you jump into what you yeah so i think one of the super cool things is that imogen um found out that she's considered an exultant mm-hmm. um or exalted actually exultant I'm saying that right. Exalt it. Yeah. Um, and that's, uh, I guess that's the, the, there's different levels of how powerful Ruidus born people are. And she's apparently one of the strongest. Um, and you know, they, the, they tell the other group that, you know, she blew out a whole city block and, you know, there's all this stuff, information and they're blow they're blowing the other people's minds with her yeah. power and then they get to talking about her mother. They know her mom and um, she's extremely powerful as well, apparently. And then that leads them into talking about how Odahan is gathering an army of these people. Yeah. Um, and so it makes sense now why she wanted um, Imogen to go with her, was almost for- trying to force Imogen to go with her. And then she kind of discounted Fern, even though Fern, you know, when, you remember back whenever we did our video on that yeah. whole fight, she called Fern a lesser seed. Yeah. So I guess Fern wasn't necessarily as powerful. She's looking for the big players. So, and, and so apparently she's gathering them all, I guess, to the Hellcatch Valley. Um, and they know exactly, they pinpointed where they were to, um, Bell's Hells, which was great because there were several areas they could have been in that the group was going to try to check. So it narrowed down to the one specific place to now they know where they're at, but it also, um, there was a lot more, you know, information that was uncovered with all of the keys that they, they, now they have to find these keys and then there was um, all of the, like, we found out that the three different planes, there are these machines, yeah. the, uh, machines right. being built on the three different planes, yep. um, I guess, to all line up in the same s- spot. Because I think we've kind of, in a roundabout way, decided that Ruidus is the prison for Pradathos. Right. And, and on top of that, Pradathos has also consumed two other gods, primordial gods. So... Um, I think the, the whole thing is to try to break him out or break it out, the entity. So, well, I also wonder, and we talked about this a little bit, like, um, you know, most of you that follow all this would know, uh, like the whole, you know, where Exandria is or the, the prime material plane is sort of like one layer. And then like the Fey realm matches up completely, uh, is another sort of, uh, realm overlaying that. Um, Matt Mercer said it, you know, to his players to kind of explain it to that way. So the Fey realm overlays the same places, just different. You're in a different plane of existence. They're the closest to one another. Like you're farther away when you go to Plane of Fire and all these other ones. Well, the Shadowfell or the Shadow Realm, depending on what he's calling it, um, kind of does the same thing, right? It lays over. So you've got these three kind of slices, um, and the yes. one in the middle is sort of our prime material plane or Alexandria, the prime material. Um, and if there's a machine on all three, what I'm wondering is what if those machines have to be aligned to yes, break out, uh, the, the captive from, yeah, break out those. um, <laughs> but also is it possible that they're trying to merge all three into one? That's realm? what I think. I think they're and trying so, to layer them all over each other to make, a powerful enough beam. I could be wrong yeah. or they could be strategically placing them in certain areas to, you know, with the ley lines or whatever to strengthen them. I think they're overlapping them, but I there's so definitely, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's definitely going to get interesting, you know, going forward because we're in what, like, I think there's only two weeks at this point until the Apogee solstice. So yep. they've got to figure out something. And so part of what the group does then is they're like, okay, well let's, they figure they knew, they know where the machine is in their plane. They're not exactly a hundred percent sure. I think it, where the one is in the Fey realm. They, I think they might have a good idea because Fern's parents stole the crown um, out of it. 
but I think that they're going to try and get um, Fern's Nana to help them. And um, they're trying to make sure that they don't leave Ashton behind and that there's not a, you know, like they can get back quickly because the time is different in the Fey Realm than it is, you know, on their regular plane. So I think Fern reached out to her and asked her like how quickly they could come and go if, if she came for a visit. And um, she said she, she had the power to take, to send them back. So I think that that's going to be something that comes up in another episode. Right. Um, yep. But they, end up talking they're talking all of this out in front of plane rider wren and you know the um the professor and everybody they're putting all their stuff together and so i guess they're going to be simultaneously working and trying to keep in contact with each other um and i think that the group specifically is going after keys to the machines well, so, and they actually even call uh, Fern's grandmother. Like they make, a, they have to do ascending to get there, and to which she's uh, Imogen is a little freaked out by the response because she's a little creepy, and uh, yeah, yeah, you know. And we we have a feeling like you know we talked about this before. Like, what if she is like a a hag or some type of other fae right. powerful uh, creature? Um, but she is apparently some type of archfey. And so anyway, so I think it's interesting that they're looking at how they can get um, some help to go tackle this. Uh, plane writer Rin seems to be the doer. That's what she said. She likes to to go and do things. She doesn't like to sit on the yeah. sidelines. The other two are sort of researchers and, and scientists type of uh, characters. So uh, yeah, it's really interesting. And they move in this uh move towards figuring out what's the the right way to go it also by the way gave me a little insight into why imogen's mom keeps telling her to stay away if yes. she is trying to protect her it's i right. think protecting her by keeping her away from the army so she's not brought in and right. keeping her away from that because um if she goes where she is then uh you know she's part of that i think it, it, it having glass half full i think that that's the protection she's trying well, to and give I, right um, and i think i think that they mentioned she got in too deep and yeah. with odahan and the power that she's got and a few of the others that odahan's gathered i don't think she can get away and I think right. that she understands that what she's doing, I mean, cause it almost sounds like a cult, right? Like there, there's this group that's trying to free this primordial being or this before primordial, whatever, you know, to, um, I guess, you know, we'll find out after, but in the next episode, but, um, yeah. exactly what they're trying to do, you know, cause I think that there's all these, you know, um, there's all these guesses and all these theories, but they don't know exactly, but, so the, the thing that I thought was kind of cool was that, um, you know, um, Fern's grandmother is, is definitely this arch fae. She's, you know, the protector of a certain area that's, it's in the fae, um, fae realm. And she's known as the fate stitcher. And one of the gods that Pradathos consumed was called the fate weaver. So it's a little interesting to see, you know, yeah. like if there's anything, you know, that's going to happen. Uh, in the in that kind of way but then also i think um um imogen's mom i think they're they're hoping that she could be their inside guy you know like yeah they, they've got nana in the fey realm and then they've got you know imogen's mom with odahan so i think yeah. they're thinking now they just don't know anything they don't have anybody for the shadow realm or the shadow fell so um I'll, it'll be interesting to see where they go first and so when they kind of wrap up this discussion, they were like, okay, and they head back. Uh, they were able to send them back to where they were. So they, they're they back at the, the basement, basically, from... Yeah. Uh, and then that's when I think it was Chetney or someone hears something uh, upstairs um, and the or the boards creak or something. And then that's where that episode ends. And then we end, And yep. uh, there's the cliff over. So let's roll this right into next episode and take it from there. So now, episode 44, um, they have made it back. Uh, they plane shifted again. So they're hearing something. 
Yep, they're and, back in the basement at Ebenai Cole. Yep. Uh, uh, gosh, I think I'm getting my words mixed up. And yeah, Ebenold Kai, <laughs> they're back in his basement. And I think it is Chetney. He hears some rustling up above and, you know, um, gets everybody to be quiet so that they can kind of investigate before they're hoping, I think, that nobody will come down there. But I mean, it wasn't hard to find the basement. So yeah, where they have sort of a crazy plan of trying to figure out what do we say? What do we do? Oh my uh, goodness. It's, you know, <laughs> Chetney immediately goes to uh, let's all get naked. It's, yes. <laughs> yeah, it this was, old uh, geezer, you know, yeah. I think we all keep forgetting that Travis, who is a very nice looking, handsome man, is playing this really old, shriveled up, hundreds of years old, you know, like, gnome, yeah, <laughs> little gnome, you know, yeah. so, he, but he's ha hamming it up, like, he's like, let's get naked, you know, yeah. and so they pretend that they're shooting an adult film. You know, because that makes the sense thematically with the Alexandria, fantasy world. guys. You yeah. know, like yeah. the adult, of it does. the adult yeah. film industry. <laughs> and, and FCG apparently is a director, um, like or a cinematographer or something. Um, so ridiculous. So yeah, it was it was very ridiculous. Um, what was funny? So yeah. I thought was even more funny is is I thought that Travis would throw it out there, and everybody would be like. Sam would be on board, but then everybody else else would be like, "Oh my god!" But everybody was kind of like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> yeah, they, they, I think semi reluctantly jumped right in. <laughs> A few of <laughs> go, them. Yeah, um, yeah, it was really funny. And then um, so Fern got naked. <laughs> yeah, Fern got naked. And then Chetty I think Imogen started to. So Orem is the bouncer. He goes up to the to the stairs to answer. They're like talking through the door of the. Uh, they try to use the immovable movable rod to like break. It was this whole thing, um, but then uh, he ends up pulling the person down the stairs. They have this whole uh, fight thing uh, that happens. Yeah. Um, there's Fern. an air elemental that that the air elemental yes. got in first underneath all the cracks in the doors That's and whatnot. Right. So that yeah. started, he was, he, the fighting didn't actually even start until the humans or the, you know, the people came in because yeah. he was confused. It was confused. Like it had yeah. no clue what was happening. They did confuse it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That, that they, they did do a good job on that. And, yeah. but they did, they ended up like the, uh, the, I think, um, they had detected that there were four people or four entities. And so yeah. one of them was the air elemental that came, that swooshed in, um, and then, you know, the door got bust into and, you know, there's three other, you know, people, um, that are coming down pretty much, you know, guns blazing. Fern transforms into a war horse or a Clydesdale while she's inside, I think. Um, on the stairs. <laughs> on the stairs. Uh, others have, I did the rest of them move out. I think they, they did get out to the upper level outside by that time right they they were all trying to move that was one of the first things they all tried to do is to try to get out of the basement because they're kind of trapped down there if they don't so yeah i think most of the others kind of move their way out um i know like um laudna spider climbed you know i think imogen miss uh, imogen teleported herself or whatever the spell is that she's yeah. got misty step or you know whatever yeah. she teleported herself and then Orum is trying to get out i think underneath <laughs> ferns clyde Fern, stale yeah. hooves you yeah. know <laughs> so um it was you know it's a comedy i think that the and really i think the fighting like the people were really kind of confused at first coming in but the minute that the there was an elementalist with them i think that was controlling the air el, the air um element but um i think the minute that he got a look at imogen's markings that's when he said they arrest them or something, which yeah. which clued the group into, OK, all right, these guys are hostiles. We need to fight them. You know, let's we're, we're not going to talk our way out of this. So, um, you know, they all try to get upstairs. I think Imogen almost gets like knocked out. But Laudna's clutch with her silvery barbs and yeah. um, is, is able to kind of save her. And they come out on top bruised and yeah. a little bloody but you know bring they, the guy they down up... and i think fcg has to spare the dying uh to keep yes. him up or keep him, yeah and that's so... the, the guy that's the elementalist and they end up taking him with them so 
funny moment ensues because they're like, let's take him with us. Let's take him with us. And they're like, okay, let's put him in the hole. And Matt's like, yeah, that's with Ashton. So then they're like, oh, what are we going to do? Just carry an unconscious over the body back of the through horse. the town, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is. So, it's funny. Yeah. 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 This is D and D, guys. So, Kinda. so they, so they, um, and th this person knows some stuff too, right? Like they end up, they finally get a chance to get away, and then they start interrogating yeah. him a little bit. But I think they do fast friends on him, or is yes. it just, yeah, they do that. So, yeah. Yeah. They try to so get they, some info from him first, and then you know he's just being a jerk, of course, and um. So they do. They end up fast frenzying him too, and um, they get a ton of information out of him. It's like some of them, more of the pieces are like are following together. So are following yeah. together. And what's the key stuff that they get out of him? Like as far as like, you know, his information that he's able to share with them. Yeah. First and foremost, the name of the group is the Ruby Vanguard. So now we have a name for the group of folks who are trying, and I mean, I guess Ruby for Ruidus, because it's red, you know. Um, <clears throat> they're trying to, really, it is a cult. I, I mean, yeah. let's be honest. They right. are people of all backgrounds who think that the gods should be taken down. So they're trying to unleash the one thing that has been known in history to kill or devour the current gods, which is Pradathos. Um, so he's working in tandem with other groups, I believe, to track down any people who know anything about Ruidus who aren't part of their group. They don't want any of that information. They don't want any of the information that could help keep it from happening to get out there. So they were after the professor as well. Right. Um, and the missing texts because, you know, the professor stole some of the textbooks um, that had the ancient texts and the, and the um, writings in them that was about Ruidus. And so we find out the judicators were there looking for that. And then on top of it, the Ruby Vanguard is also searching for those texts. So I guess it's a really good thing that they're on the fire plane um, mm. because he's got a lot of people after him. Um, and it seems like it kind of confirms that we already knew anyway, but to kind of confirm that they were on the right track with everything, they're just kind of being able to put some names to the other people and what's going on on the right. other side. Yeah. Um, like you said, and I think that's really important, but also like just the fact that it's organized, like it's more organized than probably they even thought, like the fact that right. a named organization usually mean, means there's some type of organization, right? Like that it is organized by, de by definition. And an organization is always more of a challenge, whether they're cults or whatever it is, it's more of a challenge to take down than just people that are single entities that happen to be working together because right. the organization has structure and they have fail, uh, fail safes and they have fallback positions and they have other people that can take over. Um, yeah, so it's a bigger deal right. for them to kind of navigate. But that also means if it's an organization that they can learn more about it and see how it functions. Right. And I think that's hopefully how they'll find out. I'm guessing at least that what well, they'll find out, like where do they find the keys? How do they, you know, maybe this will give them the information where they know now the questions that they can ask right. or the information that they look for. So it's, it's so, really inf yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. So he, he ends up using the term keys and I guess, I think through him, we really figure out that that's what the big telescope things are. They're calling them keys. The, um, uh, uh, the, the machines, keys, right? Yeah, the, yeah. They're, mal they're called the Malleus keys. And there's one on each plane. Um, he does give them the location of the one on their existing plane um, and says that that one is probably the most important is so in levels of like which one would be the worst to disrupt or mess up mm -hmm. the one on their mm -hmm. plane is but it's also he said it's probably also the the one most protected um and then this then secondly the one in the Feywild um that the With, unsealy and court in the unsealy and, court right yeah yeah the Ira Windigoth all them they were working on and then uh, you know and Fern's parents um yeah. were working on um so it looks like we're probably going to be going after those first i would guess especially <laughs> since there's people on each side that maybe we can that yeah. the group can kind of you know powwow with 
well what's funny is they're talking about they're like okay well let's head to let's head to the uh the Feywild and let's go uh meet up with and they were like well guys um before we go don't we have to also go get ashton <laughs> they're like yeah. yeah we probably have to go get him first so i right. think that's uh yeah it's pretty funny so um i think in setting that up right that's when they uh send the message to ashton to kind of say hey uh where are you we're trying to yeah. get out of here and then Matt kind of cliffhangers it with, well, we'll pick up next time with Ashton's response. So basically letting um, Taliesin, you know, kind of decide yeah. what, what the answer yeah. is going to be, which I think it's good. Because they're, I mean, they're getting into some good stuff. You know, I think that yeah. um, Tol Toledus or whatever his name is, he ends up telling them that, that the whole group, the whole reason why they're unleashing Predathos is because he feeds on higher divinity. And, you know, the group keeps saying, well, what, what happens when he, feeds on all of the gods what like you're unleashing destruction you yeah. know on Alexandria or on, on the plane of existence and and he's like no 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 you don't understand he only eats you know high divinity and then they're like okay well what happens after that and he's like well he moves on to another pl place but i mean do we really i mean eh, they don't really know they're going off of ancient texts so who they really know, knows what this yeah. entity can do right they don't so, know yeah but, yeah true. So they finally are able to get out of the guy that the leader is Ludinus, Ludinus Deleth. And as we all know as, you know, fans and the players know from the past campaign, he actually was in, you know, season two. He was the um, contact that Essek had. Yep. And, you know, Essek smuggled out their dodecahedron and he exchanged it with him and um so he was the one that was kind of working behind the scenes with a network of spies and trying to disrupt and cause a war um so the last we saw him i think he was in he went into hiding yeah. because the group had kind of exposed um the mighty nine had kind of exposed what he was doing behind the scenes um so and then Essek of course felt like he was a traitor and he was trying to make his wrongs right you know the whole nine yards um yeah. so we have heard his name before and so that just kind of pulls things together so there's been 10 years since everything that happened with the mighty nine and what we yeah. knew of Ludinus. so it'll be interesting to kind of see uh what he's been doing behind the scenes since then because his one plan didn't work um, so I wonder if this is then he shifted gears or if this has been a plan in the working for a really long time, you know, um, yeah. it'll be interesting to find out like how long the Ruby Vanguard's been together. And, and if that's just a piece of that group that they've named themselves that, or if it's like an overarching name for the whole, you know? Yeah. I suspect cult. that this was a whole plot line that Matt had from campaign two. You do? <laughs> I do. I suspect that the whole like connection between uh what happened with ruidus maybe not all the detail that i i suspect this thread um because of the connection um there was probably something that just never got finished with campaign two because if you really think about it like there was so much more that they that could have been explored about uh, around the dodecahedrons and right. um like where did that come from? What happened with them? All those things that never really got 100% wrapped up. It was just like the Kryn Empire had this idea that, you know, of what they were and that, you know. Right. So I wonder if that was sort of like, okay, that campaign, he knew where the campaign was going and it took this turn. So he just went with it. And then a couple other pieces. Uh, and also like, because I, I felt like in campaign two, spoilers for campaign two, um, like he, he only would have had the whole Lucian Molly thing happen if Molly died. Right. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. that whole end of the campaign would not have occurred. So he right. had to have made a change in campaign two. It must, it, cause that couldn't have been scripted. He didn't script the fact that one of his characters and that character was going right. to die. Right. So like he had to have figured out like, okay, well, I'm going to shift and go a different direction. I think that's what he did. So maybe this is campaign three is him continuing off of these great ideas that he already had set for what was there i wonder and this is again this is a little bit tinfoil hat i wonder if uh molly's background 
wasn't originally going to be Ruidus born. Maybe. Yeah. Like, I mean, the fact that, like, he that got, body like, they, is still out there, you know? <laughs> well, and you had these people that were all going to be like, that, that were all sort of like a cult of people that were coming together to raise someone and like yes. different things. And like, I don't know. I just feel like that could be a connection that we may pick up on later um, that we haven't really heard about. Like, the fact that there's, it also is Calamity era, like with Eos and like all those things. Maybe this is also. I don't know. That may be too tinfoil hat, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, anyway, and over like here said, in, yeah. on, on my end of things and my tinfoil hat is it dawned on me, you know, we're talking about the rudest born and we're talking about how it has its flares and um, people born under it have these crazy powers and they can have varying different degrees of strength. Right. Well, as we're learning with the last episode with Pradathos, um, he consumes, he came to the plane of, of where they're at and he consumed the two gods. The two gods, one of them was Ethodoc and the other one was Vordo. Ethodoc was the endless shadow and Vordo was the fate shaper. What kind of right. powers do these rudest born people have? Right. And, and also, Odahan, shadow, Odahan shadow has filled. the shadows, right? Yep. Odahan has the shadows. Imogen is at uh, fate. She sees people passing. She sees like yep. in her dreams. Like, so I'm wondering if when these flares happen, if I, I think it is definitely something struggling to get out, but it also makes yep. me wonder about if he then absorbs the power of that God or if those so. two gods are also trying to come out, you know, like, or if, if, if altogether he's a, a, an entity that, has all of the powers that he's ever consumed, right? I think consuming those two split the realm into Shadowfell, Prime Material, and Fae. Okay, so you think it was a realm... Because uh, I think it split, like, the plane... Like, because, you know, having uh, having one god that was Shadow, another one being Fate, uh, you know, like you said, yeah. um, the Fate and Stitcher, then Maury, all that stuff is more uh, yeah. Feywild She's, stuff. And she is a protector of that certain area that she's in. And so her, she's the second maybe because she's the fate stitcher, not the fate yep. weaver, you know? So maybe yep. she had to, maybe she came in and stepped in after that God got um, consumed to take over what he was protecting. Who knows? Yeah, it, it's, it's very you know, there's yeah. little threads here and there that make me, but then the powers that people are getting, you know, like they're directly linked to the gods that he, you know, the like the powers that they're getting are directly linked to the gods that were consumed there too. So yeah. it, it's interesting to 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 see kind of how that goes and where that goes and what the breadth like of the yeah. the powers are, you know? So totally gonna be interesting to figure this out. And yeah. like I said, uh I'm glad that they left left it so that um Ashton's answer is gonna be like kind of where we kick off and they'll figure out like what their next steps are gonna be. So Looking forward to uh, this coming Thursday and seeing yeah. how the uh, game plays out. So there should be a lot of good yeah, awesome. answers to stuff because I think yeah, you know, so. Ren, Ren, the plane rider, <laughs> he's going to take them to the Feywild, and then I think Maury Nana is going to get them back. I think that's kind of the plan so, so far. So and if she can make sure the whole timey wimey thing doesn't get all crazy, so. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, yes. I kind of hope it does go weird with timey wimey stuff. Maybe they come back. I kind of hope they come back that would be, before, though. That would be kind of yeah. Like that's what I'm saying. Like, maybe yeah, they yeah. go back in time a little bit, uh, which is yeah. always hard to do as a DM. But man, it's a lot of fun. All right. Well, you guys uh, enjoy, uh, and we'll catch up with you when we talk about the next episode. So, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time.